just a, a stream that I passed the other day. And, uh, oh, I see now. It's fun to put video clips in, the, in as the background. Yeah, totally. I didn't know until recently you could do that. Exercising my mind. to Kyle's MacBook Pro. Totally, totally. Hold on 18 seconds. I'm going to fetch my coffee from the microwave. Be right with you. Microwave? Why have I no sound? <clears throat> Is it really okay to use microwave? It's uh, it's the law in the U.S. You can only use microwave to heat uh, beverages. Is there no sound? I, I can't hear anything. I can hear you. We can hear can you. Hear us? No, no. Maybe you're in volume is down. Hmm. No. So, Pete, obviously you're making a joke. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> Obviously, I'm completely out of the loop. <laughs> Reminds me of a thread on Twitter. Um, I, a bunch of British people were just aghast at the way um, mm -hmm. Americans prepare tea. Yeah. Including the microwave, but there were, you know, other things too. It's like... So, story I heard years ago about tea, a um, historian friend of mine was like, so look, the British kind of take over the world and they have tea from Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, and they box it up in crates and they ship it onto the horn uh, you know, under Africa, and then it shows up in England, and it's basically like dry and broken and like twigs, and it's nothing a, a self respecting Chinese person would serve themselves. So, what do you do? Well, first you bag it. So, you, they invent little tea bags, individual bags, so nobody has no to sound. go through the ritual of, of steeping tea and doing whatever else. And then they have this new commodity, sugar around, et cetera. Et cetera. So, like, so, like sugar and cream in the tea, which no mm -hmm. self respecting, like, person in Asia would, would probably do, except for maybe chai or something, becomes the standard route for having tea in, uh, in Britain and in, and in the king, you know, in the Commonwealth. And it, so it's partly because of, and this is a story I like, so I have no confirmation for this, but because of like shipment damage, right? Um, and the availability of this newfound cool luxury thing called sugar. Anyway. I, 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 have, I have story. to share one. Oh, good. Oh, oh good. Go ahead. <laughs> the ketchup story is that um, I, sometime in the 70s, uh, scientists, you know, food scientists realized that um, the way that the standard way to make ketchup is that you have to, you have to essentially burn the, the ketchup to get it, to get it made, right? Um, so, uh, so they figured out, okay, well, we'll construct a process where we can make ketchup that doesn't get burnt. Uh, so then they tested it and then people hated it. So. It was actually the, the burnt taste that makes ketchup fun. Yeah, oh, sweet. Oh. Scott, go ahead with your story. Um, oh, okay, yeah, so mine was about beer. And I, I didn't understand that India Pale Ale is so bitter because of the high hop content. And the hops were used to preserve over the long trek down to the, the British colonies. And so, and but that's the reason that it, you know, it was just the, the taste that they had because that was what the only thing that they had was high hopped beer in order to, to make their journey. So I like I, I, similar. And Rob has just posted about Corona beer and limes to mask bad flavor. Max, were you going to jump in with, with the story? I could jump in with a, a follow on to the hops. Go, go hop. story I was told could be just truthiness or fake news was that, uh, at a certain time during like the Puritan colonial moments in the U.S., there was a decision amongst all the brew, all the breweries of which um, bittering agent to use, and um, hops was selected uh, <clears throat> partly because it has phytoestrogens in it, and it tends to pacify male aggression, um, unlike mm. other herbs. Uh, and the word that you, when you make beer and when you finally throw in, it goes from being, uh, what is it, mash to wart. Wart is like the German word for weed, I believe. And it's just like, that's when you throw in the bittering herbs to balance out the sweetness um, and add preservation value. Anyway, 
jumping in on hops info. That is very cool. Neil has one too. Go ahead, Neil. Hi, everybody. Uh, while we're just talking about uh, brewers, hops, and various other things, uh, nobody knows why anybody likes Vegemite from Australia, but it's the thick, dark brown Australian food spread made from leftover brewers' yeast. Um, most people in Australia don't eat it, but when they go overseas, they have to because that's the, the cultural norm. That's it. <laughs> Sweet. Um, and then also uh, another beer story. Um, way back when Carlsberg Brewing was young, uh, beer was dicey because sanitation wasn't great and the yeast weren't very stable. So uh, the Carlsberg brother, uh, sorry, the I'm t totally spacing on the names, um, but the brothers who started Carlsberg, basically uh, their scientists stabilized a yeast and then they gave this yeast away all across Europe, all across the world. They gave it away basically um, raising sanitation, like raising health around the world. Um, and they continue to do that for a century. So that instead of locking up the IP and selling it off or, or having a uniquely healthy beer, uh, they just spread their, their stable yeast everywhere. So um, good stories. I've got a endless food stories. Go ahead, Kevin. I've got a friend who formed a purchasing cooperative for craft beers last year, and they give them uh, the buying power of Coors uh, collectively. Purchasing co-ops are super easy because nobody has to do the, you know, mind-numbing consensus of doing a, vet, a, a worker co-op or, or a grocery co-op. You just combine your, your, your purchases. Like all the Ace Hardwares are independent hardwares that they buy collectively, uh, you know, at the same power as, uh, you know, Lowe's or, or, or those sorts of things. So anyway, that happened last year and they're all happy about it. Love that. Uh, the name of the yeast from Carlsberg is Saccharomyces pastorianus. And I just put a link, I, I just put a link to that uh, place in my brain in the chat. Um, one more food related story, anybody? Anyone? Bueller? Okay, otherwise let's do it. Let's go just do a, a- Just a quick note that yeast in the brain isn't a good look, isn't a good look. Ah. Um, Apparently it leads to fermenting violence. It's fermenting violence. I love that. Is that the male brain or? Um, so for a late round of check-ins, uh, we, we, we did a good job last, uh, last week of sort of zipping through our check-ins. Why don't we go Rod, Kevin, Hamilton. Oh, me first, did you say? Uh, Rob, but it looks like oh. you might be I, having your... No, having I'm, your I'm good. I, you caught me off guard, but I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I wasn't on the last call, so I don't know how brief you went, but my, my focus really has been a little on myself and my own uh, practices around knowledge and kind of um, getting more clear on the things that... that uh, I think are true or important, true, true. Um, Jerry, I know a part of your brain, you have my beliefs. So I've copied that structure and tried to, to uh, work with that. There's um, uh, someone that has uh, the concept of evergreen notes. And so I, and I, uh, I've been trying to, rather than just collecting stuff, and hoping that something comes out of it, trying to be more uh, intentional about uh, capturing my thoughts and my, my point in time now, uh, whether that's around health or spirituality or world events, uh, you know, just whatever, whatever those topics might be, versus kind of ping-ponging around different ideas and sources and, and things like that. So, um, I have been spending most of the, oh, Andy Matt, Matus, Matushek. Yeah. yeah, that's the evergreen note the yep. guy, um, that I've been, been watching. Um, and uh, I've been spending most of the summer in South Carolina and just returned to Arlington, Virginia for the next probably couple of months at least. So I'm physically in Northern Virginia. Cool, I used to live there. Thanks, That's Rob. Uh, then Kevin Hamilton, Max. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'll go. Uh, I've been mentioning this um, church-based credit union to wipe out payday loans, and we pitched uh, RSF Social Finance yesterday, and they 
you know, they want to work on racial justice, so they're, they're saying yes. <clears throat> and what was funny is now they want us to put a lot of numbers in little boxes to help them believe in the future. And so I always have somebody who can do speak that language, uh, and, and we're going to do that. But it's just pretty funny. They bought this. They bought the story, they bought the team, and now they, if we put numbers in little boxes, they'll believe in the future. So we're gonna do that. I, I think it's kind of a, a, a talismanic kind of thing. Because you know, we're a pre-revenue startup, but sure, we'll, we'll put numbers in boxes. You can make up numbers. Future. You know what a hockey exactly. stick looks, you know how to draw a hockey stick. Yeah, yeah, exactly, it's pretty funny. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Kevin. Uh, Hamilton, uh, Max, then Kim. Hi guys, not much of an update. I've been really busy, luckily, with clients' work. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, you know what's funny is like uh, I heard this, and I heard this person say yesterday, and I hadn't thought about this, is that um, that the companies are drawing on uh, that everybody is sort of pushing in their chips of goodwill, and they have been all summer of just like I'm willing to endure this, and that people's <laughs> stacks are running small, and that um, a sense of belonging is really hard, right? And so. Uh, have really been just noodling on that around. I mean, we can all convene the, the, the tactics and the machinations of being together happen, but the sense of belonging is really, really hard. And what's funny, I think, is that actually causes people to want to go to more meetings, which fatigues them more, right? Because you have this FOMO and you're like, well, then I'll just, the only way I can belong is by connecting with more people. And it's interesting. So I've just been really thinking about how do you, you know, in this environment, how do you connect teams how do they feel like they belong right you know and engaged so that's what's up for me thanks Hamilton yeah uh Max then Ken then Shimon uh update um brought a puppy dog into my life um into our life that's been uh <laughs> it's been rewarding um you might hear him having breakfast in the background. Um, been pushing along on um, the release of uh, uh, Tag Connector, um, an app on like a plugin to Miro onto their marketplace and uh, in talks with the Miro platform team on some other um, applications to help facilitate workshops, um, which kind of dovetails to this. It'll be interesting if they can um, It'll be interesting to uh, keep keep people posted on it. Had some really good conversations with folks at Collective Next as well. Um, love the work they're doing. And awesome. Go ahead. Join Charles for a story, uh, a flow show and whatnot a couple of weeks ago. That was awesome. Yeah, the flow shows are fun. Um, cool. Uh, Ken, then Shimon, then Stacy. Hello, everybody. Um, not much more to report than this kind of status quo. Still trying to do census making or making sense of the census, however you want to put that. Um, still inside because of smoke uh, here in the area. Uh, the fires are getting under control, but the wind has been in the wrong direction for my particular location. Um, I do have a question. Um, I've got somebody that I'd like to bring into the group and I was going to have her join today. And I thought, well, this might not be the best day to jump in since we're going to keep uh, intro is really short and, and move on with some topics. Can we set up a, like maybe the first meeting of every month is a great time to bring new folks in so that we can, you know, have a little uh, way to make sense for them to introduce themselves and uh, just, a, just a thought of how you might want to structure things. Um, that makes sense. And I'm trying to find a rhythm, sort of a balance between longer check-ins and short check-ins so we can get stuff done. But but picking the first one of the month, which which is has the unfortunate result of that means we'd have to wait a month to meet your friend. Uh, so we can also just make a little room. You're saying also for her, it would be nice to, to hear longer intros from other people. Yeah, because we can always make room for anybody to, who, who's sort of new to the group to talk at, yeah. at length. A little and bit that more. doesn't mean she has to wait a month. I just thought maybe today wouldn't be the best day. But, um, you know, just maybe going forward, making some kind of practice like that of having a space for this would be a good time to bring in new, new people. Um, we can also do a welcome newcomers kind of call uh, a couple times a month or something like that and just do it separate from our check-ins. Um, and that way with a smaller group, they actually hear much more from a few people and then we get to meet some of the new newbies, uh, whoever likes doing that, which is which turns out to be a, you know, a, good, a good chunk of the population. So it's a good, great idea, Ken, thank you. Um, 
was it Shimon and Stacy? I think, I think, yeah. Yeah, hi, can you hear me today? Yes, I hear you just oh, fine. Oh, great. Uh, so this has been a good week. I actually took the whole week off from work. So I've been able to move along some project. Uh, the other day I jumped on a call with uh, a different connected group that had a discussion with Tom Attlee, which was really very inspiring. I also am moving along with my project on a citizen commission for uh, COVID-19. There's been some uh, certainly movement. I've been able to sort of like play around with it, get some more people involved, and actually connected with a group at Temple University who just came out with uh, you know uh, 30 experts contributing to a volume about policy aspects of COVID-19 from federal to state to global level. They're having a conference September 16th to sort of like make public their report. And I actually connected with them and they're somewhat interested in the project that I'm working on. So I'm really looking forward to that. But overall, I have been enjoying getting to know more of the people in the group and uh, really learning a lot. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Shimon, really appreciate it. Um, Stacey, Julian, and then whoever's calling in from 952 area code. Um, this is my first time in the group. I was glad to see that Judith showed up because I thought I was infiltrating some exclusive male group here. <laughs> alas, alas, you're not. It's our wish that it not be this way, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I know most of you I know either from Zoom calls, many of you from Facebook. So I'm happy to be with this group and learn what's going on. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Uh, Julian and then uh, Mysterious Phone Caller and then Judy. Last week was the SIGGRAPH conference, the, an the big annual computer graphics conference, which was held on Zoom, of course, that presented a lot of technical problems because many of the, much of the material presented at SIGGRAPH is not something you can experience on a flat screen. Sometimes you even have to uh, smell things and very often touch things. And I think it was a challenge for the organizers this year to try and, and replace some of that experience. I had a great talk with Matt last week about putting it all together, uh, where it is uh, kind of like close to the universe, but we're all talking about putting it together. It changes with, to whatever you're talking about at the moment. Uh, since SIGGRAPH, I've been trying to assemble some of the material from last week. Uh, like Jerry, I use the brain a lot, except my purpose is to create some kind of little knowledge base, which then goes into my vis visualization process. And since so much came up at SIGGRAPH, then I've been trying to update those. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to figure out a way to show that soon. Um, just bearing in mind the limitations I just mentioned of Zoom. That sounds great, thank you. And and we're, we've all been prisoners in these little rectangles now for months and uh, liberation would be a, a, a lovely prospect. So looking forward to these Flatland. things getting more real. Flatland, I know. And, and VR, AR, XR, whatever has not hit stride the way lots of people had hoped it would for a long time. I know some extreme, you know, um, augmented reality uh, enthusiasts and so forth. And except for Pokemon Go, it hasn't, hasn't really permeated, uh, filtered through what we're doing. We're certainly not all donning headsets to get okay. in, these, in these meetings. Yeah, and I have a very extensive rant as to why that is and what needs to be done. So. Awesome, okay, that, that sounds like fodder for a future call. Um, and so let's go to whoever's dialing in on 952. Hi, everybody. This is Sheila. Hi, Kim. Oh, um, good. Hi. Yeah, I'm dialing yeah. in because uh, this Hi, time Sheila. is just smack dab. Hi. It's just smack dab in the middle of you know, feeding the pets and all these other kinds of activities. So I'm walking around my house and doing things. So uh, joining the video call wasn't, wasn't going to work. Um, <clears throat> I actually don't know what these updates are about So uh, cause this is my first call. So can you tell me what I, I kind of have a sense, but can you just kind of tell me what we're trying to do right now? Yeah, exactly. This is just a really short check-in, like what's new in your world. And it, it, given that most of the people have been on, on one or several calls, like is there anything OGME on your horizon, uh, you know, like visiting SIGGRAPH or building a tag connector or things like that. Uh, so gotcha. and, okay. that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, cool. Yeah, I don't know that I have an update other than to say hi. This is my first call and I'm glad to be here and to be starting to get to understand what this group is about. Yay. 
thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, thanks. Let's go to um, Judy, then Klaus, then Neil. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've been really trying to drill down a bit in the intergenerational, seven generational thinking process from two particular dimensions. One is actually building a bit of a body of knowledge that I can use for groups that haven't used it before so that they're just not hearing my verbal explanation in the crude of what it is and giving them some resources. Um, and more importantly, trying to document practices that have been effective in different types of settings. Um, I'm particularly interested in the K-12 process given the disruption of education and the opportunity for some significant changes. And so when I say intergenerational, I don't mean only sort of grandparents and through seven generations, but also mixed age group learning and learning from others. So kind of tying in pedagogy with that and trying to figure out how to put together essentially two kinds of primers, one for organizations that want to advocate for this and begin to develop their own frameworks to put it in place. And secondarily, actual examples that people can use if they're ready to put together X kind of a course or work with this particular kind of thing. <clears throat> There've been some really good um, intergenerational webinars recently with groups that are doing it specifically for education right now, um, with large groups of volunteers from the community. So much of the literature is actually on sort of senior citizen centers and kids and that blending, which is not where I'm really wanting to focus. It's a little that's more awesome. brief, but that's what I'm doing. Well, that's awesome. Judy, uh, uh, can I just jump in? Uh, I'm Go ahead, Kevin. Around, around me, I have a, a, a bunch of folks who are doing homeschooling pods who are really looking for things who are finding that. So if you could reach out to me, I can get it out there. The people who are they're hungry to try something. It's, they have a, <clears throat> they often hired a teacher but have parents around who don't know how to be teachers. That's awesome. And also Charles and Lauren have a bunch of stuff going on in Tico Lab, which is related to that. Judy, did you want to re respond? Yeah, I'm, I'm involved with Charles and Lauren and others in that. And we've been talking about that. And Kiko Labs has a kids cool laboratory with a K on Sunday, um, where they're kind of building by doing and experimenting with different approaches. Um, I'm also really interested in not only traditional, in quotes, learning opportunities, but tying in the sciences with the arts and other things in terms of creativity dimensions and co-creation of projects at early ages so that children have the opportunity to be in team experiences much earlier than most of our systems allow. Love that, thank you. Uh, you also mentioned pedagogy and uh, Howard Rheingold, who's kind of the, the spark behind Pyragogy, was on the Kiko Lab call on Monday, which reminded me that uh, Pyragogy fits beautifully, beautifully with the layer of OGM that has to do with facilitation and how we understand each other and bridging the cultural divide and all of that, and, and especially as applied to learning. Um, so I'd love to sort of build a bridge and, and see if we can't do a little cross-pollination there. Yes as we'd like to do with uh, the peer-to-peer -peer groups as Neil brought up in, on a previous call as well. Go ahead, Judy. Just one other nugget. I came across a really interesting treatise from Alaska based on grand families, which is the framing of families that are missing the parent generation, which is very common in the Native American culture. And so there's a fair bit of knowledge content there that I haven't worked my way through yet, but I'll shoot it over to you, Jerry, so you can add it to the brain because uh, it was the most in-depth sort of pragmatic family structured, but it was with parents absent. So it's a, sort of a unique dimension of it, but I think most of it would apply regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, thank you. That's very sobering. Um, Klaus, Neil, Doug. Yeah, I just uh, picked up my son from San Francisco and he moved in with us. Food is better, I suppose. But uh, his office extended uh, the stay, the work from home uh, rule until uh, next August. He's working, he's a, a marketing manager for Grammarly. So that's sort of indicative <clears throat> how, how companies are really digging in for a much longer uh, recovery time from, from, this, from this pandemic. In the food world, there is um, a, a real uptick in energy. Uh, I came across one file that I wanted to share here. Um, and, uh, oops, it, it doesn't want to let me do this. Hold on. Yep. 
Um, and actually, I picked this up in Charles' uh, uh, workshop this week. Uh, and and it, is, uh, it is not necessarily where we would like to go, you know, because a lot of the ideas uh, in there where if the food system should go are uh, actually structurally, fundamentally the wrong path to take because it's a very top-down approach, but it is indicative of how uh, much change there is in the food system and how, how that is really uh, right, in, right on top of us. Thank you, Klaus. Um, makes a bunch of sense. Uh, Neil, Doug, then Mark. Hi, everybody. Neil Davidson here, checking in from Belgium. Um, update on the weather. Uh, it's dropped about 10 degrees, 15 degrees in the last few days, and we've had a little bit of rain, so it's reduced my uh, hand-watering load in the garden. Um, but of course, now the days are getting shorter and the summer is slipping away. So um, the, um, in terms of what I've been up to, I uh, had a wonderful conversation with Jerry uh, over the weekend and Shimon about a week before that. Um, also been in conversation with Michelle Bounds from Peer to Peer through several uh, forums involved there and building that bridge that we were talking about potentially between him, uh, a chap called Johan Branstead, who's developed the Miro uh, technology platform for mind mapping and moving things around. i um, been invited to be part of a, a Rethinking Economics Antwerp uh, group that's um, been doing some work in the past, but linking a whole bunch of other players and speakers into that, including uh, Michelle Holliday, Nora Bates, and, and others. Michelle is also giving a talk uh, seminar on food type stuff. Klaus, I'll ping you with the link afterwards. I think it's uh, uh, this evening your time. It's um, uh, wrong time for me. It's going to be late, later my time, but sometime uh, your time. Um, and finally, oh, sorry, one more connection. David Jago, a uh, good friend of mine, good conversation with him. He's the chap who's the Technology of Participation Facilitator in Australia, looking to link with the work that Anne and I are doing. I've worked with him in the past, and there's some really good stuff in what he's been doing, but also in terms of how he's learning how to work online in China with hybrid meetings, people on the ground in China, and him uh, zooming in from Australia, and how to cope with the the emotional drain of speaking to a room without getting the energy back from it um, and the zoom drain type process. So some really interesting learnings as well as the stuff he's teaching. And I'll ping you on the chat here. I'm presenting and I'm on a panel uh, on a, an event this weekend around the theme, social media competence and communication in times of crisis. This is being run by uh, Gita Payne, uh, P-E-Y-N and the Formvelt Institute. And I'll, I'll ping you uh, in the uh, thing here. So a lot of good stuff happening. Uh, quickly in terms of this group, the linkage that I see is people with good stuff, good data, good information, struggling to find how do we govern internally to look externally uh, without uh, tipping all the eggs into one basket in one particular direction. So similar dynamics coming up and we're all grappling with this in the context of lockdown, but also how do we break out simultaneously. So yeah. thanks so much to you. And good to see you too, Stacey. Thank you, that's, that's really rich. Um, you're reminding me that years ago, back in the normal times, I ran into a guy whose, whose uh, job it was to help bridge the cultural divide for groups that were working internationally across, you know, and, and his typical scenario was American company with Indian programmers or something like that. And, and he was helping the sides understand each other culturally so that, they, so that they would know things like, when the other side said yes, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that they understood and they're going to comply. It might mean something else entirely. And, and, and how, and, and when the other side says they want something, this is sort of the structure of what they think they're saying and, and so forth. And I thought, this guy has job security. This is gonna be an issue forever. Um, so Doug, Mark, then Jay. Well, three things. Um, the first is I've been trying to come to terms with the whole body of work by Bruno Latour, which is quite a spectrum of interesting stuff. Uh, and it's quite challenging. Uh, the second is I've been using Rome for daily notes and seeing if that's an effective thing to do. The main thing that's on my mind is at uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, where I'm a kind of consultant. Uh, they've been doing a series of podcasts, which are quite effective with members of his community. But it's like TED Talks. It's one person at a time. Uh, so uh, 
if the, it, I think it makes them cautious. So I've been encouraging putting two people into the interviews uh, at the same time on the idea that they might encourage each other, nudge each other uh, to take stronger positions uh, out towards what new economic thinking might actually be about. Uh, it's a hard sell because people are so used to the idea of the, the one person being the spokesperson uh, at a time, uh, TED Talk like. I like the idea that that might make them cautious. I think that's really, really interesting. It's, it's definitely the friction that, that sometimes loosens things up. Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, Mark, J, then Pete. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Mark, Chibouf, um, actually residing in Oakland, California. So <clears throat> lately I've been, it's really interesting and <laughs> been really, uh, been present in so many different calls around education or learning and sense making. And we are um, actually finishing the touch on a documentary that's called, um, that's going to be called Beyond Education. And Beyond Education is um, a 14-year-old um, girl who confronts the absurdity of modern society and of an uh, inadequate educational system. She meets two indigenous Tsukuru teachers, and I'll say a few words about the Tsukuru in a minute, who invite her in a journey to explore spaces of transformation and, um, you know, which, which are offering harmonious learning paradigm alternatives to cultivate human potential. Inspired by the Tsukuru people's history of Renaissance, she finds meaning and purpose in her own life exploration. And what's interesting about the Tsukuru is that um, they've been one of those tribes that have been recognized very late um, in Brazil and were still um, enslaved, um, you know, 50 years ago. So they lost pretty much everything and, um, and relearn everything to become a tribe again. That's very inspiring. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> Excuse me, so many, <clears throat> so many bad stories there. Um, yeah, and if, if anyone is interested in the link to, um, to watch a documentary, right now it's not public, but uh, I can provide that if anyone is interested. Um, I think several people would be very interested, yeah, myself included. And if you have a link to the Sukuru people, I just did a really quick Google search and it's, they're not showing up as an indigenous tribe and usually things like Wikipedia are pretty good about that. Um, thank you. Um, and, and if they don't have a page on the web, that doesn't mean they don't exist. I just had to remind myself of that. Um, yeah, crazy times. Uh, so, J. Pete, uh, Hank. Hi there. Yeah, I've uh, one of the things I've been wondering about and where it fits in this group, I had a great conversation with Ken last week about uh, the role of collective initiation and, and also the how we hold grief and where grief uh, fits in with uh, creativity because it's hard to operate um, in great changing times without recognizing what is lost and what we're lo what's lost on a personal level as well as a collective level. Um, also been having a, some great continued conversations with uh, Collective Next with uh, Hank and Matt um, and uh, Mark as well. Um, just continuing to kind of push the brain and consider how, how can, might it be able to gather stories either on individual level or collective level and, uh, and, and what systems could be used for, for our individual wisdom as well as collective wisdom and, and works just kind of, I guess with school, it's just starting to really pick up. So, um, I'm kind of head down. Well, thank you. Uh, Pete Hank and Fallon. Uh, hi, Pete from San Diego, California. And um, I, this week has still been about tools for sense making. Uh, wikis are, are back in my conscience again, and wiki, wiki nature, um, and how the old old style wikis really worked. Um, uh, I also had an existential crisis where I went, oh my god, I've I've been ignoring Rome for whatever reason, and I have to go look at Rome again, and and maybe it's better than Obsidian, and I, I reconvinced myself that I like Obsidian better. Um, not that Rome is it, Rome just doesn't fit as well as Obsidian does for me. What have um, the Romans done for us? <laughs> 
Uh, also Airtable and Trello and an open source alternative to Trello called WeCan. Um, and I've of course been doing video transcription, working on preserving files, archiving files, uh, especially big video files. Um, uh, and I'm also thinking about decentralized profiles and how that might work. Thanks, Pete. Um, Hank, then Fallon, then Matt. I had to come out of the darkness. Um, <clears throat> greetings officially from Boston. I just moved into a new apartment this week, actually on Tuesday. Um, so I won't give you guys the grand tour only because it's, one, it's not appropriate and two, it's barely unpacked. So um, no, I, I think, you know, my life physically, uh, as, as it's physically manifested is in a little bit of a dis is in disarray, which actually kind of reflects a little bit of my mental state for the past week. So um, the next couple of days, I'm really just kind of focused on uh, thinking about the things that I want to pursue and tackle over the next couple of months, because I've been kind of laser focused on, you know, this move and, and just kind of pushing things along. Um, and I want to kind of reinvest time back into some of those other projects. So that's kind of where I'm at. Super. Um, awesome. Fallon and then Matt. Hey, all. Um, Fallon, uh, currently in Brooklyn, New York. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I've had a lot on my mind recently and I've been having some very interesting conversations and been heavily involved in some series doing around um, decentralized sense-making tools. One specifically that I'm developing with a group of amazing folks. And um, yes, I, 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 I've, I've been kind of diving into stories, um, stories that would allow the discoverability of um, some epistemological jewels that are embedded within communities and their collective narratives. Uh, Ken, do you mind muting your, your line? Sorry, go ahead, Fallon. Yeah, just some jewels that can be found within certain communities, within communities, and um, how to share those. Um, awesome. And I don't think you've been on a call where we've talked about this role called story threading. Is no. That right, okay, no, so separately, I'll, I'll send you some links, but we're, we're trying to invent a role like that for events um, that, that you just described it quite well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that'd be really cool to figure out if there's a, if there's a match there or how that might work. I think there would be. I'm very interested. Cool. Uh, we will go there. Uh, Matt and then uh, Scott, did you introduce yourself earlier? Did, okay, good. Uh, Matt and Scott. Hey guys. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the privileges of going last is you get, or, you know, toward the end is you get to hear everybody's comments. One of the challenges is you get to hear everybody's comments. Um, you know, maybe to bring us all the way back to um, where this started and yeast. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, or at least off of this call, is uh, an earlier conversation, Jerry, we had about, um, you know, sort of kind of yeast starter, right? You know, sourdough starter, and how do we create something that, um, uh, like uh, the brothers that uh, created Carlsberg, that we could send out um, into the world and make everything more um, healthy and stable. Um, and maybe that's part of the, you know, part of the challenge for us at OGM is not to invent um, a monolithic something that everyone comes to us, but to create lightweight, um, interesting structures that um, spread out into the world. And I um, had a chance to be, um, to experience the flow shell um, and um, what that looks like and feels like and um, challenging myself to learn some new skills of um, getting into flow with other people without sort of feeling the need to redirect, um, you know, that flow. So um, thank you for that, Charles. And it's been nice connecting to other people on this call offline to, to actually start to build some things. So um, that's, that's my check-in. 
Thanks, Matt. Some, sometimes we facilitators have like a corgi dog instinct or we pick, pick whichever herding breed you want, but it's like we need to nip at the heels of the, of the sheep that are out at the edges of, of the herd. And, and it, it, sometimes that's hard to, hard to turn off. Uh, Scott? Hi, everyone. Um, you all inspired me to take a little deep dive with your, your native land uh, placements that you have. So I found out that Interlock, and this is Interlock in Michigan, so we're between two lakes, Duck Lake and Green Lake, which sounds pretty boring, but I found out those actually aren't the names of the lakes. They were changed a very long time ago, and they are still called Duck Lake and Green Lake, but they are actually Lake Wabakaness and Wabakaneta, which are in the Ottawa language, and what they mean is water lingers and water lingers again. And I thought that those were really beautiful nuggets of, of language there. Um, and, you know, they, I think that they relate to a lot of the water issues that are going on because we really want that water to, to linger in the right places and perhaps linger again. Um, quick comment for Doug. Oddly enough, my son just graduated as an engineer and is into physics and things. And, you know, so he's, he's in his 20s. And I, I passed along your Garden World site to show some of the things that, that you had been part of. And he said, he was blown away by, he said, that is, that is a list of people that, that he's been connected with that are basically his heroes from his school and education. And so I just thought I'd say you're, you're continuing to inspire, inspire the, the youth, whether you know it or not. So um, I just wanted to pass that along. Um, so the thing that I was thinking about that relates to this group specifically is we talked about memes and what we can do. And what, I, what occurred to me was there's been times in the last 50 plus years where there's been spontaneous organization and action by government and the collective wholes. And, and what I, I thought is like we have uh, you know, Y2K, we have the, you know, the, the 2012 Mayan calendar thing. We had uh, the World War II rationing. We had the whole two minutes to midnight concept. Um, and those things, once they were turned into a, a, you know, couple word phrase, activated people for some reason. And I thought, maybe there's a way to say what is it that we're we think is the, is something worth working on is it co2 is it water is it food and turn it into one of those things that feels like that kind of easy to share easy to at least understand at a basic level and that also turns into spontaneous organization and action um so I think that's what I, oh, um, so for example, just really quickly, I've been unemployed for a little over a year doing freelance work. And one of the, the metrics, the thing that I did, my little three word was days until broke. Okay, so how many days do I have until I'm broke? And then what I did was I just kept taking, how much are we spending every day? How much money do we have? and it creates X number of days. And as long as I can keep that the same or growing, I'm good. Now I don't have to understand the whole system or anything like that, but if I just keep them, my eye on that one metric, I'm good. And I'm, I'm proposing, is there a way that we could say, what's one metric? I know it's mm. really, really complicated, but can we make it Y2K? Can we make it something that everyone says, oh, okay, I understand what this is and I need to do this about it. So that's it for me. Um, Scott, thank you. Um, and that, that clicks into many things for me. And I think also for like Lauren and Charles uh, who've been thinking and working on memes a lot. And, and I think a lot of us are either part of communities that are trying to solve huge thorny problems and so forth and one of the goals is to find what is the what is the shortest phrase that travels well what is the retellable story as jay might say um that that sort of it's kind of self-encapsulating it's it's got its own little little shell like a snail um that then set down someplace can trigger positive behaviors 
right? And, and what, are, what are the small things we can say or do that travel well and that are contagious uh, in, a, in a good way? And if we could, if we could only crack that code, uh, then maybe uh, we could catalyze larger scale social change. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I like that a lot. And as, as Pete posted in the, in the chat, uh, startups call this runway. What you were describing as days until broke, that, that's, that's like how much runway does a startup have, which is you know, ca cash in the accounts to be able to pay salaries or, or do, you know, do whatever to keep things running. Um, did I miss anybody in the, in the check-in? I think, I think I made my way around my grid in both screens. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Charles. No worries. Um, kind of overflow, but uh, a lot of people already mentioned a, a number of things that I'm excited about and was going to mention anyway. Um, the Flow Show, it's Mondays. It's the next two Mondays. It's part of Kiko Lab, uh, Collective Intelligence Collaboratory, um, uh, mon ongoing Monday series. And, and uh, for another two episodes, I'm in charge. And so that's the 7th and the 14th. Um, on the 7th, we have um, any of you who are welcome to, to pass through, of course. Um, I think Jay Golden, maybe you're gonna be there. I, I hope um, you join us back in the story room, possibly. We talked about that. And um, Peter Dowson of the Story Canvas will be back also. And we have um, Odo Honan will be sharing his uh, learning and doing maps. And um, this week we had Howard Rheingold, also Jerry and, uh, and Matt and Pete and Judy and other regulars um, who are here. We also had, as, as, men, as uh, some of you also participated in the Tuesday Metacogs call with Tom Atlee, starting to share um, uh, about his collective sense-making ecosystem model. And he will be back on the following Tuesday on the 8th of September. Um, so yeah, I'll put some, some info on the link, uh, links in the chat. And the Clue Laboratory, the Kids Clue Laboratory is, is Sundays and anyone, um, Kid, kids six to 12, um, would be welcoming. Pyragogy for kids, thanks. Awesome, thanks Charles. Um, and Geeko Lab is, um, is a sister organization to OGM. We're sort of intertwinkled already. And part of what we're trying to figure out is how to intertwinkle more and better. Uh, what, what do those connections mean and how do they work? So uh, everybody feel, you know, jump, jump into their events as you, as you like. Um, and we'll see where that goes. Um, and then uh, I haven't checked in, so I'll do a really brief check-in. The thing that's top of mind right now for me <clears throat> is I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to finish a speech, uh, like a 20 minute speech for Unfinished, which is a conference run by some young people in uh, Romania. Uh, and if you go to the site, it's pretty interesting. Uh, two of the other speakers are Anand Giridharadas and his wife Priya Parker, who were kind of heroes of mine. Uh, and I, I really like them. I really like the whole thing. They've created with some software developers a new platform for the event. So it's not going to be in Zoom. It's not going to be on Hopin. They've, they're kind of prototyping something that I got to test drive a little bit uh, last week, which is really pretty nice, pretty interesting. It's, it's still how do, I, how do we chat? How do we see each other? What do we do? But they've, but they've done a few things that I think are really quite interesting. Um, and historically they've had they've held this conference for a couple of years not that many but a few in person so this is the first time it's gone completely virtual and in in person they make people apply to join it's free it's free to attend um they're they're funded by the ados foundation um it's free to attend but they make people apply because they want participants to sort of really be all in and really be, be participating so so they're doing the same sort of thing now and they were going to send me a link so that anybody in ogm would sort of automatically be be let through but they haven't done that yet but if you want to attend i recommend you apply and mention ogm um they should still be sending me a, a link um and I've been convincing them, I think I have, to just live stream the whole thing anyway, because there's a difference between being able to be mixed into the event and being part of the conversations and all that and not. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the setup for it. It's gonna last a week. It's, gonna, it's a virtual conference for a week starting at the end of September. Um, and, I, and the talks are going to be mostly pre-recorded, so I'm doing mine pretty soon. Still need to finish what I'm actually going to say. Uh, but, but my talk is basically titled, Trust is the Way Forward. <clears throat> and uh, and roughly I'm saying, hey, I think trust is actually the way out of all of our thorny problems. Uh, even though I live in Portland in the Pacific Northwest, which is like a, apparently a hotbed of anarchists who are trying to melt the world, actually it's not. Uh, and, you know, and, and sort of walk into the issues in, in that way. 
Um, so it, it goes back to a lot of my work on trust, which, uh, which I still uh, really love, which is still threaded through a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. It's just not uh, front and center for me. Um, and has a lot to do with the work of you know, democracy that Tom Attlee works on. And as, as I just think about the different topics that we're touching, uh, trust is so, so deeply involved everywhere. How do we organize, how do we organize learning for you know, intergenerational learning? Uh, has a lot to do with trust. Uh, how do we tell stories that, that travel that, uh, that has a lot to do with trust? So there we are. Uh, any, any reflections on our check-in for a second? I, I, I have a, a couple things I'd love to try to achieve in the call, but just any thoughts back on the, on the check-in or what happened? Hey, Jay, this is Sheila. I've got a quick one. Yeah, please. So I can't remember who it was who, who was talking about, um, you know, not necessarily recreating the wheel, uh, but how do we get things out into the world? I just wanted to mention something that that triggered for me. I was, uh, I used to work at T-Mobile. I'm in Seattle, Washington. I didn't say that earlier. I used to work at T-Mobile's headquarters. And a couple years ago, T-Mobile partnered with the Ashoka Foundation to run what they called the Changemakers Challenge. And the idea was to get people who were, I think, um, I think it was something anywhere between like 13 and 20, uh, who were doing change in their communities. And basically, uh, for their organizations that they had created, um, they basically were, oh, they, they were basically applying for grants. And it was in a contest form. And uh, they brought the, and it was amazing what some of these people were up to. I just was blown away. But they brought the 30 semifinalists into Bellevue for a couple of days. And one of the events that they held on campus was a mentoring session. And I was one of the volunteer men mentors. And one of the groups was this group of kids from um, Savage, Minnesota, who had organized these events where basically they were community fairs, but they, uh, but they also had done things like they made sure there was a blood drive truck there and they made sure there was a food drive going on and there was a, um, like a clothing drive and things like that. So it was a community fair that also did a huge amount of good in terms of collecting all of this, these things that, that the community needed or people in the community needed. And one of the problems that they were facing is that they were looking for grant and support and mentorship on was, um, People were calling them from other communities and saying, we need your playbook. <laughs> um, how did you do this? We want to do a similar thing. And they were just looking at it going like, we don't know how to do this. Um, and so there was just several kind of things around like getting stories out there and, you know, getting things that are already created out in a different way to different communities that that just kind of resonated for me as like a real world example. Um, and that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Um, Sheila, love that. And, and I, think, I think a big piece of what we're trying to do is how do we replicate what we know and share it out in ways that are useful to other groups. Uh, and a, a playbook uh, is a great kind of capsule for, for what that is. Uh, and I think most people are, don't know. I mean, what, what, what strikes me a lot is when groups convene and decided to go take some action, they're still faced with a bunch of really weird techno platform questions about, okay, where do we save stuff? Do we just, uh, the thing that struck me at the start of lockdown was the proliferation of Google Docs and Google spreadsheets for useful bodies of work. Like, like there were just dozens and dozens of them as people were trying to self-organize uh, around the country. Uh, so how might we create a better platform for sharing what we know? Um, so th that's very central for, for what we're talking about. Um, anybody want to riff on that? Yeah, Jerry, I mean, I Please. think, um, you know, one of the things that just sort of for the, for the new folks, um, what's interesting about OGM is um, we're simultaneously having conversations about ogm -y stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is what this check-in is about is sort of what are you working on? What are you thinking about? But I think Jerry, you know, to kind of bring us back to uh, the core of this is there's so many good things going on in the world, right? Um, uh, and there are so many playbooks that are already written or being written as we, as we speak. The question is, is what's the, what is the meta layer that lives on top of it um, that allows those things to be easily accessed um, and communicated and shared? Um, and those things are 
um, multi-generational or, or indigenous wisdoms that, that last those things are um, new things that are being invented. Um, and I think that's what you're gonna find with this group of people. Um, you know, and I think about some of the work that Julian's doing, which is just um, uh, this comment that we, you know, um, if we only knew what we already know, right? Um, and how do we get that to happen? Because I think, you know, the Googles of the world and um, those things have been so almost like corrupted by, um, you know, information that's useless, um, that's there designed to, um, to feed the numbers in the boxes, Kevin, right? Um, <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's part of the problem that I think we're trying to solve in addition to sharing the problems that we're trying to solve, like, you know, the food system and the education system and those things. It's more of the, you know, the meta, the meta kind of stuff that I'm interested in seeing if we can make some progress on. I have to jump in on top of that, Matt. I, I, I think you know, talking about a playbook and talking about a meta level, what Judy is doing in terms of inter, the awareness of intergenerational learning fits really well now on something new that's happening that people don't understand. Because you know, I have one grandson who's in a virtual school, and it's really not working socially, but we've got a big tent, like literally a big no walls, uh, four kids for the six-year-old, four kids for the nine-year-old at distance in a bubble. And it's really working, but the parents have to be involved. And they aren't aware of thinking of themselves as teachers. You know, they're, they're in a new thing. And so this is, I think things get meta when you add a level of meta thinking to a thing that's already happening that people are trying to think about and can't figure it out. And what Judy's doing making all those parents, because I'm surrounded within, you know, a half a mile here, we probably have at least six tent-like uh, teaching pods of people that are in networks that I know about, right? They've hired a teacher or whatever, or, or some experts, and they don't know how to think about it. And the parents were involved in it. So I mean, adding a meta level to, to an emergent phenomenon, you know, emergent you you evolve to a higher level, you know, when when the bacteria becomes a bacterial phage. I think Judy's thing can make all those parents more aware of themselves because they're thinking about themselves in a way they don't know how to put together. So I, I think that's really cool. I sent you an email. I'm I'm really interested in your work too. Cool. There's also um, organisms like slime moles that that change into a different kind of organism at different scales and at different yeah, at the uh, in, level, envi right. environmental yeah. circumstances. So you know when there's just a few spores, it's one thing, but when they collect up, they can actually turn into a, a thing that looks like a like a slug and can move around. Uh, things right. like that. Exactly. Um, thanks, Kevin. That's what uh, happened with Celine Dion. Yeah. <laughs> she was bacteria and became that. Anyway, you know that. I love that. <clears throat> Doug, go ahead. So I have an observation and a hypothesis. Uh, the observation is that we are not very good at keeping our introductions short. It's hmm. like we don't have the discipline of collapsing it into a nice little poem. Hmm. And I'm gonna propose that that weakens our ability to communicate the general messages we're concerned about outward into the broader community. And that we need to learn how to uh, speak much more concisely in an interesting way. I, I think I mostly agree. And then there's a part of me that's, that uh, thinks uh, is, list, is replaying a couple of the check-ins and thinking, I'm not sure how that would have been made more concise. Um, partly also, we have no separate outlet to figure out what each of us is doing. So this is, this is sort of our ongoing quest about where do, we, where do we put our profile pages, for example, and what is on them. <clears throat> um, so that so that the check-in can be, you know, it's really hot outside. I'm tired. Next, uh, you know, as as we get to know each other as well. So partly we're we're doing a whole bunch of different tasks here because we don't have the the support of where our general interests are. And I, my my email sig is a now page, you know, slash n o w, which lives on my website, which I don't keep updated often enough, but is an attempt to say here's the here's generally the stuff that I'm working on. Uh, which is a, which is a, a try at that, a swing at that. But we need we need much juicier now pages. My brain <clears throat> is actually the best version of that, but I don't really, I don't think that my now page is reflected in my brain, which is something that just clicked in my head, and I'm like, oh, I should do that better. 
uh, because then someone could wander through not only what I'm interested in, but each of those contexts and go deeper. Uh, but we're doing a little tiny bit of that here. Neil, go ahead. Just picking up, and forgive me, I, I missed a bit of what Kevin said, but just picking up on Jerry shouldn't have to defend the, the check-ins. Um, a complex adaptive system learns by watching itself in motion. Right? And so we have to see who's moving where, at what speed, with what baggage, you know, with what capability. Uh, I've had four or five amazing conversations with people from this group because of things that were said during check-ins. Um, so the connections are being made not just here but beyond here. And I, I think that as Jerry and I talked about the other day, we need a process for this and recognizing are we ants in zigzag find the resource mode or are we ants that have already found the resource and are taking it back to the burrow mode because they're different models of the same, uh, same organism and I think my sense is we do need this sort of rich check-in. I think this has been relatively short for a really good check-in and I've got a bunch of connections already that I'm going to go and pursue uh, and see where to from here. So yeah, but I, as I say, didn't hear exactly uh, what Kevin said. I heard the last little bit, so forgive me. And, and my hope is exactly that, that when I hear that you all are having, uh, you're having meeting up and having calls and, and sort of st starting to conspire to <clears throat> take over the world like Pinky and the Brain, I am thrilled. Like that makes me really, really happy because, because it means something sparked well uh, during our check-ins or during our conversations. So partly what I'm hoping is that we get to know one another and then go do stuff together or talk together and then come back in and say, hey, when this got said over there, you know, uh, it came back and I, we just went crazy and, and, and have built this thing. And here's, here's like the, the mock-up of the, of the new spaceship. Um, that sounds really terrific. And then also, um, I think we need to do more other calls other than our Thursday morning check-ins because then we'll get the sense that the other calls are actually project calls and there's no problem with a project call just going running off and doing something, right? <clears throat> so, um, uh, and, and the topic that I was hoping to turn our attention toward, but it's already past an hour here, uh, was this idea of story threaders. And I think I'll, I'll spend a couple minutes on it and then I'm, I'm gonna set up a different call so that anybody who's really interested in helping frame up story threading can come join us on that or, and then anybody who can't make that call can watch the video later. But I think, I think we just sort of need project calls and to not worry about it. And so there'll be more calls, but then people can opt in and the check-in can be the, <clears throat> what Neil just described really, really eloquently, this sort of idea for, for, for us to watch ourselves. Go ahead, Charles. Just quickly, just to give another um, invitation to the, the story room at the Flow Show. I mean, and, I've, and I think it, it seems that it'll be sort of a weekly institution within the Monday Kiko Lab calls. We'll have this story room. It may not um, always be limited to an hour, and we're not so so hard ass about the schedule. But but just to say, that's that's a great place to to explore all these things as well, and kind of go into story. And this um, the use case that, that we're looking at is this online learning um, imperative that's not the, the learning part anymore, but, but uh, evolving. So just to welcome story threaders there as well. Cool. Other thoughts where we are right now? I, I, and also other thoughts about check-ins. I have really complicated <coughs> thoughts about check-ins because this, they're so, you know, they're, they're important yet they're, they're, uh, they take a lot of time. Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I was just saying that, you know, there, there is an assumption by some folks that this is a group that should be collectively working toward a goal. I, I, I wonder if that's true. Um, my own dream is that we collectively Can you say that again? I, can you, I heard collectively working toward and I didn't hear what happened with yeah, what I, Kevin there's said an after assumption, that. Yeah. You want what Go I ahead, Kevin. said. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, there, there is an assumption that this is a group that should be working collectively toward a goal in this format. And I, I, I question that. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, I, I agree on, on, it depends on what level um, we're talking about and, and what goal we're talking about. If we're talking about, you know, uh, banking black or we're talking about the food system or we're talking about the education system or we're talking about you know, the work that, uh, you know, I'm doing with Jay and, and folks, then, then the answer is probably not, right? Um, because we're all working on different things and that's part of the beauty of this group. If the answer is, how do we create systems and structures and platforms and, you know, playbooks and things that allow the working on a goal to be a more impactful, um, 
kind of effort, then I think, you know, that sort of that, again, that meta structure, I think is what the hunt is here. And, you know, we sometimes get lost in the, the kind of the pursuit of our individual goals and, and miss the conversation about the structure, which this is. So I, you know, I agree that, um, you know, with, with Neil and in, in folks, which is, this is the, these, these are the moments in which we can find areas where we can then partner together on projects and things. And then when we partner together and do that work, we should also be thinking about what makes, what would help us make those partnerships more effective and how do we build, you know, those things on top of it. It's almost like the scaffolding that allows us to reach that higher, you know, higher level. Right. Um, so that's the, I think that's the shared hunt versus the shared hunt being our individual passions, which need to be pursued as well. And I'll, I'll add to that, um, <clears throat> drawing on some of the original metaphors as we were starting to kick around these ideas for what OGM could be, that we're sort of a mushroom <clears throat> in that, in that uh, a mushroom is sort of what happens to mycelia when they come up as a fruiting body in order to sort of reproduce and go out elsewhere. But to borrow uh, the metaphor that, that Judy really likes, um, our project ideas or what we're doing are kind of like mycelial links, like hyphae running out to find other, other, my, my, my <clears throat> other mycelial networks or to pop up mushrooms in new places or to do whatever. And then the second uh, natural metaphor that we used early on was this is an estuary. And estuaries are where salt water meets fresh, where rivers run into the sea. <clears throat> estuaries are zones of uh, high nutrition, high creativity, and uh, mixing zones, basically, where, where different kinds of critters meet. And that's kind of what our check-in, the role our check-in is playing right now, because not so much other things. Uh, maybe the, uh, the, the uh, Google group <clears throat> is doing this a bit because we have different kinds of conversations. But, but the, the reason to choose estuary is that just shit happens in the estuary. New kinds of critters emerge because there's hybridization, there's you know, opportunism, there's other kinds of things. And, and partly, I'm interested in the emergence of multiple goals that are coherent with or consistent with or resonant with the overall mission of OGM. And so if one goal is, how does Rome, like Rome, Obsidian, Notion, all those kinds of things, all those funky tools that are coming out right now, um, which, what, where, how do they work, but how do they cross over to this other world of brain, Kumu, other kinds of visualizations? Because I'm sitting here thinking, I don't like Rome because I live in two point to five dimensional land of the brain. And when I go to an outliner, it makes me sad. I just get sad in all the outlining tools. I feel like I've taken a giant step backward. But the brain has this notes field that could just, just very, very easily be one of these outliner tools with super great backlinks and all that. And I'm like, that would be hot. That would be fantastic. Why does that not exist? And how might that work? And that could be a goal-oriented project that could turn into some new code, could turn into something that we all wind up using. <clears throat> so. I'm really interested in emergent goals that that resemble the little hyphae that are poking their 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 little noses through the soil to find other networks and bring in other projects that are already working, things like that. And then the Zoom I, chat is is, in, is brutally inadequate. Agreed. I jump in. Go ahead, Sheila. And then Judy. Yeah, I was just going to say a couple of different things. Going back to what Doug said, I I feel like there's a sort of a I'm experiencing the conversation around the check-ins as being either or when I think there's actually, to me, I would frame it more and the way I experienced it is, is more in the frame of an interesting challenge. The thing that Doug said that I think really resonated with me was the idea that, you know, maybe not knowing or maybe not doing things or challenging ourselves to summarize things really quickly could have an adverse impact on how we explain ourselves to other people. And I just want to just say, I, I think that there's a real I agree with that. I think there's a real, I think there is a real challenge in that. I think anybody who has, at least in my experience, at any time I've had to explain myself, uh, either as someone who's uh, seeking a job or as someone who's trying to sell my services as an independent consultant, if, you know, there, the reason why they call it an elevator pitch is, is that there is a need to be able to get across fairly concrete things or fair, not concrete, but to get across things in a fairly um, concise manner. And I think the idea that, you know, so I would kind of riff on what Doug said and kind of say, there's an opportunity here to potentially practice getting conceptual thoughts across 
very briefly that I think is a really interesting uh, provocative statement. So Doug, I don't know whether that's what you meant, but I just wanted to say that. To me, that's the way I heard what Doug said. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is, is that uh, I, I, similar to what kind of what I just said about Doug's um, statement, what Kevin said also is, is something that I've been grappling with over the past couple of days as I've been kind of getting more involved in what the group is doing is I don't get the sense that there is actually agreement on what this group is trying to do which is fine um, and also at some point I feel like there needs to be some sort of agreement for me to even be able to understand how I might contribute because quite not, quite frankly right now I'm just sort of like well I'm interested I'm listening to a really interesting conversation but I don't necessarily have some thoughts about how I could contribute productively. Thanks Sheila. Um, Judy then Lauren. You were muted. So there we go. Good. 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 Cool. Background noise. Um, I think this question is really complicated and it comes down to different roles of people in different settings and different groups and their function. Um, I see this initially as just a network of connecting like-minded individuals with very diverse skill sets and very different talents as a resource pool for networking for more specific tasks. And so it's kind of like, to me, this is a communication hub. And from that, we would then break into a group that's really technical and can do stuff in enabling the technical aspects of virtual that I'm totally incapable of doing, hopefully in a way that someone who is only moderately apt at this can learn. And secondarily, taking the ideology that a lot of people have very different levels of knowledge and moving it to the next level by sharing it with other people, getting feedback on that and expanding and refining the scope and context. So it's kind of like an expand, contract, expand, contract in a way, because you take in a bunch of stuff and then you, you sort of try to get to the real nuggets of truth. And then from those nuggets of truth, you expand again and build some more things. And I'm not very good at verbalizing this, but it's a complicated thing. And I think we need to sort of, in a way, separate the philosophical, ideological, academic piece from the action piece, but they're both really important. And our attempt with setting up the discourse forums uh, is to create space for all those conversations to have in, happen in parallel without any of them individually drowning out the, uh, the, this Google group, which, and, and the balance between those things we haven't sort of really figured out. Um, and one of my hopes is to make it so that newbies coming in can quickly find their way into the conversations that have juice for them particularly where they can apply their skills and their interests and find some help to get things done that they're trying to get done that are still resonant with the, the overall vision here. Um, that's, that's still on the wish list, but that's, that's really what we're trying to, to get done. Lauren, over to you. Well, I think that there, um, I think with a group of people uh, who are this smart, it's actually incredibly difficult if we think we're gonna get, have like the OGM mission yeah, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But one thing that I would think would be extremely helpful, and I think that Kevin was talking last week about how he um, was involved in a purchasing cooperative. If, and Judy totally set me up, if OGM is kind of the communication uh, hub, what I think would be extremely helpful is uh instead of deciding the overarching story is just to take one small step together and that would be to set up a purchase, purchasing cooperative so that we can use a variety of software such as uh, Miro and Trello and these kind of things to have more interoperable communication. Mm -hmm. That's a great Sorry. idea. I'm muted. Um, Fallon, did you want to jump in? No, I said that's a great idea. Cool. And partly, <clears throat> partly what we're trying to do here is rethink and remix the tools because one of the more ambitious goals of what OGM could do is help us invent the next communications medium. Right? I mean, we've been, we've been on the inner tubes kind of as the web since Tim, Tim Berners-Lee <clears throat> kind of created the web and then corporations turned it into a magazine and a movie theater and whatever else. 
And we have a possibility here to actually step through into some new way of communicating. Um, and we're not going to get there like next week, and we're not going to get there by drawing uh, a flow chart of what that looks like right now. We're going to get there by experimenting and testing a bunch of new things out and having enough freedom to roam into uh, what that might look like. Other thoughts on this topic? Maybe this is the room where we apply the sorting hat and you go to other rooms. <clears throat> Uh, exactly. I love the sorting hat metaphor. It's one of my favorite things out of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the sorting hat is in my, I think it's in one of my uh, talks about education in that it would be great to, you know, to have some kind of a sorting hat to help any learners find their way into the group and the topics and the methods that work best for them kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I'm Hufflepuff or Slytherin. Can't tell. Um, so let me, let me talk for us. We're, we're actually near the end of 90 minutes, so we should probably wrap soon. What I'll do is I'll schedule a separate doing call about uh, framing up story threading uh, uh, as what it is. But I'd love to just ask the question, um, we have this organizing thought that, that we're going to use guilds to try to figure out kind of crafts or trades that, that, that fit into OGM. And we've, I've been sort of brainstorming a couple different kinds of guilds. Uh, we like guilds because guilds have this idea that there's a, an apprenticeship model where there's juniors who come into a guild who can learn uh, the craft of the guild by having seniors, anybody who's ahead of them at any, at any level, sort of uh, help them into the, into the guild. Uh, but guilds also in some sense certify, validate, vet, uh, in, some, in some other ways sort of test and improve the skills level of the participants in the guild so that when they go do work in the world, uh, it's, at a, it's at a particular level and people keep, can keep improving the skill level. So that's nice about guilds. And then guilds are also, uh, you know, strange attractors in that, oh, here's a story threading guild. What on earth is that? And then you sort of discover it. And so they're, they're an attractor for people who need that craft, need that skill and can hire people from the guild. And the guild doesn't all have to be about being hired. That work can be done for free or not. But, uh, but framing it up as a guild creates that, that sort of opportunity. So I just love to put that in, uh, in front of the group and say, what do y'all think about guilds and what would it mean to operationalize guilds as OGM? <clears throat> like, how does, that, um, how does that connect with, how do we get things done uh, together? Whoever would like to. And if you hate the idea of guilds, say so too. Like uh, I, I'm, I've always liked guilds. I, I kind of, I can, I can think my way past the restraint of trade and other kinds of problems that guilds had uh, back in the day. But I think a, a modern guild can be actually very productive. Neil, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> uh, I must there. have unmuted as you, as you, as you unmuted. I, I haven't um, tried. Okay. In that case, I missed completely. Um, two types of guilds that I'm aware of. One is of like-minded people like silversmiths, and there's different levels, and there's the apprenticeship process, and there's a how do we work together, and how do we improve our craft. The other is a permaculture guild, which is deliberately diverse players planted together for companion plantings, which is this check-in. And so this check-in allows us to see who's got fertile soil, who's, who's producing what sort of nutrients, what's, what's coming back into the ecosystem that I can use, how can I integrate that in a way that works. So this check-in to some extent is a little bit like a bean pyramid. You know, you, you tilt the canes up and you say, broadly we're aiming for that point there, but each of your seeds is growing in a different way, a different rate, uh, and we're gonna try different things with each of those. So to me, a guild could be any particular uh, bean vine Right, but the, the TP we're building is something which I think has a bit more structure, which says ultimately, and I'm assuming this, we're aiming for something which has a higher purpose than any of our individual purposes, and it's gonna create a structure, it's gonna create uh, an ecosystem of players that can coexist together, be resilient together, and do benefit to the farmer slash humanity. And, and so I can see how a growth metaphor allows that to happen. And if one seedling isn't performing, do you rip it out? or do you encourage it to reach its potentials? And if so, what's it lacking? And this is where we start to feel that. In collective presencing circles and collective alchemy circles, they also check in on what is the barrier that's preventing you and what is the grief that you need to burn off and what is the alchemy that needs to occur here. And so as if and as these conversations get to that deeper level, what is it that's preventing you personally 
and you collectively, us collectively, from achieving things better than we could do alone, because otherwise you don't need to be in a diverse guild. And I think also, Neil, what you just said is a great topic for a separate uh, OGM call, just this idea of collective sense making, collective alchemy and grief, and, and how do we hold grief? What, what role does grief have? I think that's a great, great uh, uh, topic for us to talk about just in a focused way. So I'll, I'll, I'll frame up a talk around that. Uh, who else wanted to jump in on guilds, et cetera? And uh, also, Neil, yeah. thanks for thanks Such for a delight. Me about the uh, ecological meaning for that. Uh, sorry, uh, Fallon, was that you jumping in? Just a comment on guilds. Uh, I I like the idea of having zones of expertise and people who can help individuals who want to acquire additional skills. I get a little nervous with the guild in an isolation sense or an exclusive sense, and so having it be very permeable would be important to me. And, and lots of maybe some satellites then that would expand the guild concept so that it's more readily spreadable without putting too much of a workload on one particularly highly skilled person. Thanks, Judy. And, and in some weird way, this here check-in is like the Guild of Guilds in a strange way. Um, and, and what we want is a lot of fluid conversation across them. All I'm hoping for with a guild structure is to have places, attractors so that people know where to go to have a conversation about, or better still, to learn some skill really deeply, right? So, uh, so uh, one other, one other dimension, I worry about the, I mean, this group is very generous. And so people will say, just call me or send me or, you know, I'll send you or whatever. But that one-on-one -on -one is intention really rich, but can be draining on the experts. And so it seems to me that within our own little culture, we could be priming the pump for the actual ways to create disseminatable information so that there's little primers or a link to use to get to a certain point, then come talk to me because you can learn some more from me kind of thing. And that's, that's moving the guild to the virtual realm. And one of the nice things about martial arts and guilds, the two models that I know of, is that, is that juniors of any level <clears throat> kind of take responsibility for people just a step or two behind them, which is the best way to learn anything anyway. Like, you know, that's when we had one-room schoolhouses, when we had several hundred thousand one-room schoolhouses across the U.S., we had a pretty educated population. Then we industrialized schooling and separated the kids from each other, which, which creates artificial scarcity in a moment of abundance. Very, very weird but we decided somehow, we, somebody convinced us that the Prussian military school system was the way to go to train up large bodies of humans. And to me, that was what, like one of the steps we took that broke education uh, as, as kind of a, a learning mechanism. Charles, and, and Charles, I will just note that your really interesting background made it harder for me to see your hand was up. So my apologies, go ahead. Okay, my apologies too. Um, just to chime in, I, maybe this is useful. It's something that's been coming up um, with, with Lauren and me and Kiko Lab and a, and a few of our conversations around dashboards. And there was some kind of talk about building a platform or questions about if that's a, a good way to, to go. Um, and somebody's got their volume up. Maybe. I'm getting an echo from somebody who has an open mic, uh, but I don't see anybody whose noise that's coming from. Go ahead, Charles. Try again. Um, let's see. This came up um, in relation to our cool laboratory with the with the kids and the feisty moms, and also with um, interestingly with Tom Atley the other night um, in regard to his collective sense making modeling and how it's sort of vast and how can we ground this into sort of using it in a practical way. And some of us here um, today were in that call as well. And so I just came on this idea of a dashboard of dashboards, because you said something about a guild of guilds. And I'm, I'm, con I'm trying to connect this idea of guilds with the p possibility of thinking in terms of dashboards, kind of bridging that, that tech piece. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're thinking about what we need for the cool laboratory for the moms or, or other parents, guardians of learning um, as a dashboard, and then approaching something so vast and meta as, as the ecosystem of collective sense making, but in terms of dashboards or you know toolkits, sort of interfaces. Anyway, over. And I think we're I think we're talking our way around individual and collective sense making artifacts. That that how do we get oriented? How do we share what we know? How do we show progress? Uh, how does all this stuff work? Given we have a rich digital medium that could be representing so much more than project management software and blogs. Um, uh, P 
Pete, do you want to jump in and explain what uh, Lauren's pointing to in the chat? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, Usenet was actually a really interesting. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I can tie this to anything else right away, but Usenet was a really interesting um, uh, transmission medium, communication medium. Uh, it did a broadcast thing. Uh, so this was before we had inst always on connections between computers and things like that. So um, there were tons of channels and threads in each channel. So you can kind of think of it as a huge, massive Slack. But um, uh, it got the, the whole thing, the, all of the data of it got shipped around asynchronously around the world. So one of the cool things about this was that there wasn't any centralization. Um, news kind of flowed all over the world. Um, uh, another interesting thing is that nobody, no centralized person could see what you were reading. So you could dump stuff in the stream of Usenet and it would kind of bubble across the world and then you could pick it up locally. So your local sysadmin could see what you were reading. But, but in general, people didn't have the purview that Google has or Facebook has that, oh, Pete is reading blah, blah, blah about this. And you know, I, you know, I, I don't want Google or Facebook to, to know that necessarily. Um, so this is in relationship also to, I think I, I'm looking for decentralized and federated ways to spread information, um, particularly so a good first thing is profiles. Um, Lauren has also got something that she calls hash bins where she wants to f decentralize and kind of federate thoughts, um, kind of like the brain thoughts. Um, that, that's probably a good enough. Love to talk to, to I, I could talk on and on um, about both the nuts and bolts of, of Usenet and why, how it ended up evolving to that. Um, there were a couple different, you know, takes at it over a decade or two of getting better and better and better. And by the end of it, it was a pretty sophisticated and amazing system. It's one of those parts of the early intro tubes that many of us miss. Go ahead, Julian. I just want to point out Usenet is still very much alive in, the, in use. Yeah. Very cool. Um, we, we're going to wrap in a couple minutes. Any, any concluding thoughts on where we are? Um, my to-do items and also any, any things that, that people would like to, to do from this call. And Judy, I'm sorry, I, I mean to remember to reserve 10 or 15 minutes at the end of our calls to do that. These calls are less do calls, but uh, I will set up a couple of different um, uh, separate OGM calls. Uh, one of them for uh, framing up story threading, uh, one of them about collective sense making and grief. And there may have been a third topic that came through that was heading that way as well, but at least those two for right now. Um, anybody else closing thoughts as we um, finish up this call? Uh, Jay. Yeah, uh, I just, just coming back to the check-ins, I would love to support moving the dial on that. I feel like I come in and I'm, I'm talking about the things I'm doing, but not the things I'm dreaming and not the things that I'm feeling and wanting to change on, which is really a part of a bigger story. And I feel like everybody's got a bigger story they're working with and they're moving the dial in specific ways and trying to speak about it in a way that might be relevant to the group, which is very hard to guess on. Um, so I think I'm not complaining about it. I think it's got a lot of value, but I, I would like to kind of come back to that idea that we could have either a micro story that we can drop into that's part of a hash bin, if I'm understanding that correctly, uh, it's, it's, it's hashtagged, or just, you know, you could spend five minutes scanning to see what people are up to, what's related to you, what you want to move the dial on, and maybe make the conversation more sophisticated. Um, I love that, Jay. And it would be lovely if I could just say, okay, good, everybody set your filters to plus two or minus two, and we'll just bump to the meta level and everybody just share that part. And I, I actually think that, that that meta level part is hard for a lot of people to get to and, and then articulate, and it requires trust. <clears throat> we could probably get there with a light group process and a little bit more time, like if we could slow things down. I think it's really, I think it's hard to get to that. I may be projecting here, but I think, I think, I think mine's probably pretty accessible just because I'm always chewing on that and, and, and like the, that's top of mind for me a lot. But for many people, we kind of need to explore our way toward what our own meta is. 
Um, and that would be a really fun group process to do. Um, and does that, and I feel like I'm exploring even as I'm saying that, does that resonate for you? It could be both. It, you could still have a story of the week or a haiku of the week or whatever. I just think a little more framing that would illuminate where the, what dial you're moving as related to your bigger picture, I think could be helpful. Cool. Uh, Neil, then Matt. Yeah, just picking up on that, Jerry, the, the conversation that we had and looking at how do we get what I call vertical integration, because it's this issue of what level are we getting off at? And to operationalize things, you're obviously down in the nitty-gritty of a specific project, but at the high level, you're still operating within a set of cultural ethics norms as defined either within the organization or within the culture or within the globe. So ultimately, global system ethics are critical. Um, Sorry, and we are getting, 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 we are getting a little bit of an echo. Uh, Sheila, it might be your phone. Yours was, was one of the few that, that's not muted. Um, reminded, Matt, sorry, just just, just reminded me of many you. years ago. My father took me to an open day at the Queensland University, and they had a, uh, a an early days digital recording device that actually allowed playback uh, a split second afterwards. And the phrase they got us to say while listening to our own words was, "I'm not a pheasant plucker. I'm a pheasant plucker's son." And you should have heard the laughter in that booth. <laughs> That is awesome. And, and it turns out that there's some delay, like 300 mi uh, milliseconds, which destroys our ability to communicate. Like, like a little, we can tolerate a little bit of delay in hearing ourselves back a little more and just it's really, really hard to focus on what you're saying. Yes. And one very quick thing. My partner, Anne, has been listening into elements of this conversation. And when we have the, the breakout session on grief and those other con uh, collective presencing type elements, I'd, I'd like to invite her along into that Zoom session, if that's okay. Um, I just want to say there's an open invitation to invite anybody to any of our calls. This is all meant to be completely open. Uh, please invite people into OGM at, at any level. This is like wildly open. And what I really want is as we wander through this, if, if, if you're like, oh my God, you know, Sue should be here. Like, please, like immediately uh, invite folks in. Matt, then Ken, then we're uh, out, of, out of today's call. Yeah, I'm just wondering, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear from people, um, you know, if it's time for us to have a longer duration collaborative session, something that's um, multi-day where we work through a design process to sort of sort some of these things out. And if we're ready to do that, you know, if we feel like we've started to assemble enough interesting and interested people, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's time and I would be happy to, you know, design that and, um, you know, to work with this group to kind of figure out what it's going to be. And then, and then we would take a few days to actually work through some of these things in, in earnest and, and in greater levels of detail. That's a lovely idea, Matt. And if we framed up a couple of different things we'd like to do in those days, we could probably get a, a whole bunch of, of parallel things done. So awesome. maybe I'll start in a, um, a, a thread in discourse just to get people to send me some objectives, knowing that ultimately there'll, there'll have to be some choices made and um, some refinement. So um, let's get that going. That sounds awesome. Thank you. Um, Ken? Matt took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what I was going to say is maybe it's time. It feels like we're, we're hitting this, uh, this critical mass point where, okay, there's so much on the table. We need to spend some focused time sorting it out because I don't think we can keep doing it on these, these hour and a half calls. So mm -hmm. thank you, Matt. And thank you, everybody. Makes sense to me as well. Yeah, thank you all. Um, let us wrap today's call there. That's a really nice ending point. Um, see you all on the list and all on these separate calls. And please invite anybody who comes to mind into these conversations, this group, whatever, that, uh, that would be great. Can I just say I love the way that Ken comes in in a very reclined state with those dulcet <laughs> tones and just says, here I am reporting in from where I'm at, lying on the couch, and it's just such a great time to be here with you all. <laughs> I love you all, you know, it's just beautiful to be here. I love you too, Ken, you're gorgeous, and thanks for inviting me into this group. It's like Elvis That's communing with us. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. But I'm still in the building. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Bye, guys. Ciao. Hugs to everyone. Thanks, Judy.